Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How are you, sister? Alhamdulillah, how are you doing? Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. Good, alhamdulillah. I appreciate your email. Thank you. Jazakallah khairan. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Let's see. I'm trying to find a presentation here. What about that? I may, here we go. No? Let's see. What have I done here? Bismillah. I am, let's see, share screen. I want to share the screen. I just want to see the screen. No, we stay here. She wants to go play over there. Assalamu alaikum, Imam Saik. Assalamu alaikum, brothers and sisters. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. It's a beautiful Sunday to start with your voice. It's been very interesting. It reminds me of the old days of communism when we wake up in the morning and we had to listen to a certain voice or a certain channel. Well, al alhamdulillah. This is a choice by ours now, not by, by force. Alhamdulillah. Jazakallah here, brother. That's beautiful to hear that. Alhamdulillah. So good to see all of you. And I'm just trying to get myself here all set up. Almost there. So, um... Mashallah, it's good to hear your voice, Gennard and Darlene. Lisa, welcome. Rizwana, alhamdulillah, welcome. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to Doug and uh, Mika, who I believe just joined us. Alhamdulillah and Wasel, welcome, welcome. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaykum salam wa rahmatullahi wa There she is. I'll do this. Okay, Mason, I just want you to know if you're hearing me, I'm making you a co host. Okay, that's done. my picture for some reason. Yeah, that's what I wanted. I'm doing that. This old man came rolling home. <laughs> okay, alhamdulillah. Okay, so it is the 11 o'clock hour. So we will, inshallah, get started. Um, firstly, I want to uh, ask you to forgive me. Um, I don't see Winter on this morning. Um, but she asked a question on Thursday night, and I don't feel I handled that question well. Um, I, uh, yes, I am recording. Um, 
so I wanted to clarify her question about farb and wajib. Okay. Um, I try as much as I can to avoid um, getting into fiqh issues. Uh, Usul al fiqh is the sort of first chapter of knowledge of Islamic jurisprudence. And most scholars say it's better to stay away from it. Islam is built on five things, um, five pillars. And if you get those right and you really focus on those, um, I think in the long run, you will do much better than worrying about a lot of fiqh issues. But what I wanted to say is this. In the four major madhabs, and, and I have to say this as well, uh, at the time of the Messenger of Allah, uh, the Messenger uh, Salam's demonstration of a thing was all that it took for the people. If the Messenger did it, the people wanted to do it. And so when in the history of Islam, the four major schools of thought were developed, um, it's created some ambiguity for some ambiguity for some stu students. Um, so let me try, if I may, to answer the question, why do we now have farth? And a lot of people say fard, but it's the vaud, so it's farth, uh, like farther, but without the er on the end of it, so farth. Um, why do we have farth, wajib, and sunnah now? And who defines or what defines what farth, wajib, and sunnah is? And uh, by the way, that distinction is only made in the Hanafi school. So the masjid on the south side of town, the Islamic Center Orlando is a Hanafi masjid. Um, I believe predominantly the Goldenrod, Masjid Rahman was a Shafi masjid, but I'm not sure if Imam Noor is Hanafi or Shafi. However, let me try to explain that to you. Um, Scholars of the Hanafi school took things a little further and I'll explain why that might be important, um, but they're the only school that did that. Uh, scholars of the Hanafi school of jurisprudence are of the view that there is a difference between far and wajib. And so the problem is when we say, for example, to our teenage children, something is haram. And then we hear somebody say music is haram and murder is haram. It's such a broad spectrum. So the Hanafis have a way of sort of making that more clear in that respect. Uh, so um, farb, according to them, is what is irrefutable proof by absolute evidence. So the Quran says it, khalas, that's it. No question about it. Um, or the Sunnah said, say, for example, if it is a Sunnah uh, Hadith Qudsi, which is revealed by Allah, a, a Hadith revealed by Allah, then that is unquestionable, it's irrefutable. Um, wajib is what is necessary by presumptive evidence, um, not necessarily a hukam, one of the 212 laws or orders from Allah. Um, the sunnah, according to the jurists, is an act of worship for which the doer is rewarded, and the person who does not do it is not punished. So when you're practicing the sunnah, you'll get rewarded. If you don't practice it, you won't get punished. So um, these 10 things that I shared with you about the first 10 days of Dhul Hijjah the only one of them that is considered um, very, well, all of the fasting, all of that is sunnah. Let's just say that. But the IE day is a highly recommended, what some of the Hanifis might say, wajib, because the Prophet ﷺ never missed it. In today's lecture, you'll see some more things. So some Hanifis will say that anything that the Prophet never missed, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then they will say that is wajib. But in terms of Islamic jurisprudence, wajib and fard uh, has the same definition. Um, for example, the two sunnah rakahs before fajr and after maghrib are a sunnah. If you do them, you'll get blessings. If you don't do them, you will not get punished. Um, and then there's the haram and the makru. And the haram is an absolute sin. If you do that sin, you will be punished. Uh, the makru is that it is distasteful to Allah. 
if you do it, you won't be punished, but if you avoid it, you'll be rewarded. So I hope that will help you. For example, pork is clearly haram, unless you, as I have given the example before, happen to end up on Gilligan's Island. And obviously I'm metaphorically speaking, and the only thing to eat there would be a pig or a can of beer. It would be an exception to the rule. Whereas, um, and another example, it is haram for a male to show any part of his body in the public uh, more than between his navel and his knees. Um, but it is considered like uh, mustahab or highly rewarded to, to display modesty. So you could technically say, well, it's allowed for me to pray without my shirt on, uh, but I am in front of a law, would it be the most respectful thing? I wouldn't be punished if I did it, but if I have respect for a law and I'm practicing modesty, I will be rewarded. So hopefully, uh, I know that was a little lengthy there, but I felt like I needed to clarify that answer. I never like to take the risk of, um, or, or make a mistake and not correct it. And I'm, I'm sad, I don't think Winter's here today, uh, so that I was a, oh yes, she is, humdol, now I see she's in attendance. I hope you got that correction, Winter. Um, so let me um, try to move into where we are today. Um, if you'll bear with me. The, we know that we're in the month of Dhul Hijjah, and that literally means the possessor of the Hajj, the possessor of the Hajj. So what we're going to do today, before I do the Khutbah Hajj, I'm going to tell you what we're going to do, and then inshallah, we're going to do it, review it, and then we'll end the class. So we're going to review uh, sort of and finish the um, Dhul Hijjah presentation, and then inshallah, we're going to move into the presentation on Hajj. Okay. So what I want to say is, and a reminder to all of you and to myself that Tuesday, July the 21st at sunset, we will be entering the first night of this sacred month, the most sacred of the four sacred months. It is actually specified as the most sacred of the four sacred months. And if you think about when I finished, um, I talked about the farewell sermon and I talked about how Allah has made your blood, your properties and your honor is sacred to one another. So think about that sanctity of what it is to be a Muslim, a Muslim life, your brother and sister and the sanctity of their being um, and how we should honor one another. And then, of course, just a um, quick review that um, on the day of Nahar, the 10th of Dhul Hijjah, the messenger stood in between the Jamrat uh, during his Hajj, which he performed um, and said, this is the greatest day, the 10th of Dhul Hijjah. The messenger started saying repeatedly, O Allah, witness, I have conveyed your message. He then bade the people farewell the people said, this is Hajjat Awadda, the farewell Hajj, Dhul Hijjah, the 10th uh, year after the Hijra in 632. And as I said, and then we'll move on, our beloved prophet died uh, the Monday, the 12th of Rabi al Awal, uh, in the 11th year of the Hijra, about three months later. So, in Alhamdulillah Ta'ala, Nahmaduhu wa Nasta'inuhu wa Nasta'kfaru, وَنَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنْ شُرُورِ أَنفُسِنَا وَمِنْ سَيِّئَاتِ أَعْمَالِنَا وَمَنْ يَحْدِهِ اللَّهُ فَلَا مُضِلَّ لَهُ وَمَنْ يُضْلِلْ فَلَا هَادِيَ لَهُ وَأَشْهَدُ أَنْ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهُ وَأَخْدَهُ لَا شَرِيكَ لَهُ وَأَشْهَدُ أَنَّ مُحَمَّدًا أَبْدُهُ رَسُولُهُ Indeed, all praise is due to Allah. We praise Allah. We seek Allah's assistance and forgiveness. We seek refuge in Allah from the evil within ourselves. Whomever Allah guides, no one can misguide them. Whomever is not guided by Allah, no one can guide them. I bear witness that there is no God, no deity worthy of worship except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is alone with no partner and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is his final servant and messenger. I'm about. So there are five things 
that the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, never abandoned. And when you hear that, I hope that your spiritual ears are perked up and that your spiritual eyes are wide open. There are five things that the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, never abandoned. Fasting the day of Ashura, fasting the first 10 days, the first nine days of Dhul Hijjah, fasting three days of every month and praying two rakah before the dawn prayer. So back to that correction that I made in the earlier part of the class today, I really never, ever, ever want to promote any kind of rigidity. The Prophet ﷺ said that Islam is a middle road, that there, it is about our mazan, it's about the balance. So a lot of times when we get hooked up in these thick issues, we can find ourselves falling into rigidity. So I know that sometimes because of my passion, it sounds like that what I'm teaching is a farb, but it's not. A lot of it's a sunnah. Uh, but when you see that it's something that the Prophet Wasallam always did, if you love the Prophet more than you love yourself, Wasallam, then of course you will want to implement at least those things at, inshallah, a sort of bare minimum for those who are striving to be mutakis, for those who are striving to have taqwa, for those who are striving to elevate their ranks, you will always want to be striving to do what the Prophet Wasallam did or said. It's not required and you won't be punished if you don't, but if you want to elevate your ranks, please be encouraged. And um, I'm being asked to ask if you can see me. I can see myself, so that means I think you can see me. Is that true or not? Can everybody just uh, r raise a hand or something and let me know if you can see me? The, um... Imam Sykes, but the lecture isn't showing. All I see is a black and white screen. Is that what everybody else sees? Oh, you don't see me? Okay, let me... We can see you. I can see you. It's Here, just now, now I can see. There we go. Perfect. Okay. Is that better? Yes. Can you see yes, me as well? You. Can you see me as well? Yes, thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. So let me just move my camera over to here so that that's better. All right. Alhamdulillah. Uh, so Dhul Hijjah is a season of worship. It cannot be discounted that it is the most sacred of the four sacred months. Ibn Qayyim Rahimullah, who died in 70, 751 and after the Hijra, said, indeed, its days are the most excellent of all days with Allah Azawajal, exalted is Allah. The ninth day of Dhul Hijjah is a day of Arafat, this is the day when the pilgrims gather on the mountain plain of Arafat, praying and supplicating to their Lord. This is the last day when Allah completed his revelation on Allah's messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And so we see in Surah Al-Ma'idah, Surah 5, verse 3, this day I have perfected your religion for you, completed my favor upon you, and have chosen for you Islam as your religion. This is such a powerful verse because we are told that we are aware that in the farewell speech that we're going to lose our prophet, Salih al And then we are told that this day I have completed my Hajj. He had to complete his Hajj before he died because it was the fifth pillar of Islam. There's some deep, deep beauty in this. This day I have perfected your religion for you. And so we, in order to perfect our religion, we must try to do as much as we can that the Prophet ﷺ did. And therefore, that's why I'm not, I don't want to overly focus, but I'm not too concerned sometimes about far than wajib as I am trying to get close to my Lord. Umar ibn al-Qattab narrated that the Jewish man said to him, O oh, Amir al-Mu'mineen, leader of the Muslims, there is a verse in the Quran which if was revealed on us, the Jews, we would have taken that day as an Eid festival. Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, asked, which verse? He said, this day I have perfected your religion for you. 
and pleaded my favor upon you and have chosen for you Islam as your religion. Umar replied, we know on which day and in which place this verse was revealed to Allah's messenger. It was when he was standing in Arafat on a Friday. So here again, we see the beauty of this season and the beauty of this revelation uh, so powerfully. The day on which Allah took the covenant from the progeny of Adam, it was reported that Ibn Abbas narrated the messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam related. When Allah created Adam Alayhi Salam, Allah took a covenant from him in a place, Na'aman, on the day of Arafat, when Allah extracted from him all the descendants who would be born until the end of the world, generation after generation, and spread them out in front of Allah in order to take a covenant from them also. Allah spoke to them face to face, saying, am I not your Lord? And they all replied, yes, we testify to it. Allah then explained why Allah had all of mankind bear witness that Allah was their creator and only true God worthy of worship. So here we go back to the soul world where we are familiar with Allah in our fitra state because before we became a human, before we became a soul, sorry, before we became a human, we were introduced and we testified as souls that Allah was our Lord. And so here we see it in this beautiful verse in Surah Al-Araf, Surah 7, verse 172. That was in case you mankind should say on the day of resurrection, surely we were unaware of this. We had no idea that you, Allah, were our Lord. No one told us that we were only supposed to worship you. Indeed, the day of Arafat is a blessed day, and there is no other covenant greater than this covenant. So if you think about the beauty of this day, and if pilgrims don't complete Arafat, they actually don't complete their Hajj. This is how important it is to us. And we will never be able to say that no one told me because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asked us and we testified when we were souls that we knew Allah. So the day of Arafat is a day of forgiveness from sins freedom from the hellfire for the people who are present in the plain of Arafat. And by the mercy and the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, 22 years ago, I had the great blessing of completing my Hajj and being on that plain of Arafat. Aisha, Rabbi Allah, who Anha narrated that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, there is no day on which Allah frees more people from the fire than the day of Arafat. Allah comes close and expresses Allah's pride to the angels saying, what do these people, these hajis want? And so when you see the beauty of Arafat, although it is just a sunnah, and some people say just the sunnah to fast on that day. I think we are missing something. In addition to this, fasting on the day of Arafat is a sunnah. So let me add that. And an expiation for sins for the residents. The 10th day of Dhul Hijjah is the greatest day of Hajj. It is known as Yom al Nar the day of sacrifice, since it marks the inning of the major rite of Hajj, the sacrifice. And it is on this day that the Muslims commemorate the bounties and blessings Naam, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It was recorded in a hadith by Imam Ahmed that the day of Nahr is the most virtuous day to Allah. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said the greatest day of Hajj, pilgrimage, is the day of Anahr, slaughtering. So the days just get better. We have this day of Arafat, 
where our sins can be forgiven for the previous and the next year here at home. We don't have to be a pilgrimage to get this great blessing if we practice the sunnah. Ibn Taymiyyah, who died in 728 after the Hijra. The most excellent day of the week is the day of Jumu'ah, Friday, by the agreement of the scholars. The most excellent day of the year is the day of Anar. The next most excellent day after Anar is Al-Qar, the day that follows when the pilgrims reside in Mina. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the messenger of Allah and all of the scholars point out to us the beauty and the greatness, the vast rewards of this great month. This is the festival of sacrifice. And it is one of the two festivals which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has granted our ummah. In Jahaliya, Allah's messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam came to Medina and the people of Medina had two days of play and amusement. So Allah's messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam said, I came to you and you had in Jahaliya two days of play and amusement. Allah has replaced something better for you. So we don't just get to play. And I think of a lot of the holidays that we have. I think we have 21 holidays in America where people play and they amuse themselves and they fulfill all the desires of their nafs. And yet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us some auspicious days where we can purify ourselves, be forgiven for our sins, and receive so many great blessings. The Prophet Sallallahu said the day of Al-Fitr and the day of Anar and the days of At-Tashriq, the three days after Anar, are our days of Eid, festivity, and they are days of eating and drinking. These are days for celebration, but in them are days of great worship for, before them. From the day of Arafat until the Asa prayer of the 13th day of Dhul Hijjah, one should make the takbir after every obligatory salat. Now, why do we stop at Asa? Because Maghrib of the 13th day brings in a new night and a new day. That would, once, once sunset comes, once Maghrib comes, you're now into the 14th night. And when you wake up, you're in the 14th day. So this is why that is how the three days work. So it's not three of our days, it's three lunar days. This was done in the times of Jahaliya when they slaughtered their tahuts, their false objects of worship. So the takbir were prescribed in order to indicate that the act of slaughtering is directly to Allah alone and by mentioning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's name. So what do we do in these great times, in these auspicious months and days we are constantly active and consistent in our worship. The Prophet ﷺ loved acts that were consistent and said that the best deeds and the best acts are those consistent. Deeds which are less preferred are made superior and more beloved to Allah in these days than the superior deeds performed at other times. Jihad, which is the most superior of all deeds, is less superior than the voluntary fast in these days except that the mujahid goes out risking him or herself and his or her wealth for the sake of Allah and does not come back with anything. The only way to get a greater blessing than jihad. Imagine that. Hajj and Umrah are the best deeds performed in Dhul Hijjah. So fasting as many days as possible, especially the day of Arafat, which is the Sunnah, all the deeds of the son of Adam are for him, except for fasting, which is for me. And I am the one who rewarded. And this, alhamdulillah, is from Sahih Bukhari. The takbir al-mukayyid, uh, and this is a restricted takbir, uh, because typically uh, most ahadis frown upon saying the takbir out loud in groups. So um, you make takbir, but typically in, in groups, it is to be made silent. However, 
in many of the Sufic orders, they will all be reciting subhanAllah, subhanAllah, subhanAllah together. Um, and the majority of scholars say that this is not the correct practice. So this takbir, this special auspicious time, leads us to Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. La ilaha illallah, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, wa lillahi alhamd. And as I said to you on Thursday night, the great Sahaba, they would recite this out loud in the marketplace. This is a time that we can do this. So let me remind you that this is legislated and it is done after the five obligatory prayers which are performed in congregation. This begins from dawn, Fajr, on the day of Arafat, the ninth of Dhul Hijjah, for those not performing Hajj, and from noon, Dhuhr, on the day of sacrifice, the tenth of Dhul Hijjah, for those performing Hajj, and it continues until Asa prayer on the last day of the days of Tashrik, which would be the thirteenth of Dhul Hijjah. And so, alhamdulillah, um, this should be recited all day and all night on these days. This is what we're enjoying to do. Perform plenty of nafal, uh, voluntary prayers, recite and memorize Quran, abstain from disobedience and sins because disobedience is the cause of Allah's anger. Who would want to make Allah angry in a holy month, the holy most sacred month of the Islamic year? The Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Verily Allah has a sense of ghayra, honor, prestige, and anger over its violation. And Allah's sense of ghayra is provoked when a person does that which Allah has made prohibited. It is a disaster that your heart dies without you noticing. It is as if you say, O Lord, how often I rebel against you without you punishing me for it. And Allah replies, how often I punish you without you even noticing. Haven't I removed the life from your heart? Our face no longer becomes red for the sake of Allah. Means our heart is dead and it does not pump blood to our face when we commit acts of shame. So if you notice when people are ashamed, they look down and they're usually pale, a little green sometimes. It has become blameworthy for one to have zeal and to react strongly when they see corruption or evil. So what do we do? We hasten to make sincere tawbah, sincere repentance. We forego all the deeds which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala dislikes, the makru, in open and in secret out of regret for what has passed, abandoning them immediately and being determined not to return to them again. In Surah Al-Qasas, Surah 28 and verse 67, but as for him or her who repented, believed and did righteous deeds, then he or she will be among those who are successful. And we want to be among those, alhamdulillah, that are successful, inshallah. Give charity. In these auspicious days, give charity. Attend Salatul Eid. Now this year, practicing social distancing. Um, I would encourage you to be safe. Um, I will be doing, inshallah, if Allah gives me life and breath, I will be doing an Eid Khutbah just like we did for Eid al-Fitr. Um, and I'm not even sure that there are going to be any congregational Aids this year. Uh, and if there are, I'm sure that it will be highly policed, maintaining the six foot distancing rule. The sacrificial slaughter of the day of Aid al Adha is a Sunnah. Uh, if you can't afford it, there's no harm. If you can afford it, if you do it, you'll get rewarded. If you don't, you won't get punished. Kirbani means sacrifice. At least one third of the meat from the animal must go to the poor or vulnerable. One third of the meat for the family and the final third to our neighbors. 
So may Allah make us to be, inshallah, Rabbil Alameen, among the righteous people and among those who receive the great rewards, inshallah, of this great month. And so what I need to do here is share my screen again. So let's see here. Are you seeing my screen, folks? I'm not getting any response. Not yet. Okay. Just bear with me a minute. Let me fix that. Alhamdulillah. Okay. Nope, we lost the screen. It's just one straight line. Okay. There we go. Now you're seeing it? Okay. Yep, you're back to where you were. Perfect. Okay, thank you very much. All right. If anybody can tell me how to do this more smoothly, please do. Um, because we are recording this. Um, so I want to talk about Hajj, and, and today the rest of the lecture will focus a lot on the Holy City, um, interesting facts about the Hajj, and then inshallah we will move uh, to actually what happens in the Hajj, uh, inshallah, on Thursday night. So um, I wanted to share a few things uh, Saudi Arabia has canceled the Hajj for most of the world's Muslims. Uh, only pilgrims residing in Saudi Arabia will be allowed to attend this year. Um, now, this is not the first time that this has happened in the history of the world. Uh, in 1932, because of flooding, they were not able to have the Hajj. Um, there was armed conflicts in 930 AD um, when there was a sect of Ismailis and they... Um, raided Mecca because they believed that the Hajj was a pagan ritual. Um, it was also suspended by the Abbasids um, dynasty in seven, who ruled in 750 to 1258 um, and uh, until they paid a ransom uh, for its return 20 years later. In terms of disease though, um, uh, the first time an epidemic of any kind canceled the Hajj was the plague in 967 AD. Um, and so this has happened before. Uh, sometimes we will say things are a first, and in fact, it's just out of ignorance, but we're in fact not. So I will, I will mention sort of briefly that COVID-19 um, means that what will happen is instead of 3.2 million around that, average that, people descending on Saudi Arabia, uh, only maybe 1.9 people in the country itself uh, will be attending. So that means um, that uh, <laughs> that's a huge economical impact on the Saudis. Um, Alhamdulillah. I just wanted to share a few of those facts that I thought would be interesting. Um, I will share this with you that I also think is very interesting. Um, the uh, Hajj numbers by 2030 uh, are predicted to be 6 million, and Saudi Arabia is actually undergoing a massive uh, airport renovation in order to be able to handle that by 2030. That's the vision. Uh, they've installed a train that goes from Mecca to Medina. When I was there in 98, that was not there. That was not the case. Um, so th those were just some interesting facts. I'm just trying to look here and see if I had written down anything else, but I think that's the most interesting fact. So um, now what happens is there's something called Makat, and they are like stations. There are five places that you have to go through if you're not, if you don't live in Saudi before you perform the Hajj. And you go there because most of the people have been traveling for many hours from various countries. They don't smell real good, um, and they need to take a gusel before they can do the Hajj. And I can't, I'm not sure, but I think my flight might have been 19 hours. If 
I remember correctly. It, it's a very long flight. Um, and so you go and then you're on a bus and you're dealing with two or three million people, whatever, that are all trying to do this. Um, so here's where we're beginning to talk. To begin the Hajj, if not already in a state of purification, the pilgrim should enter the state of Ihram. Now, Ihram is this two seamless, it looks like terry cloth, white pieces of cloth. And I wish that we were live today and I could actually show it to you. Um, for men, they will take their goosel, they will shed themselves of underclothing, jewelry, deodorant, uh, anything except those two pieces of cloth. Now, I'm told that nowadays they allow this sort of fanny pack or belt thing over it. Um, we were warned that not to wear those because somebody could cut it and pickpocket you, take it, steal it, because stealing goes on in this sacred month uh, because not everybody's trying to purify themselves. I also, when we were there, you weren't allowed to put a safety pin or anything, but apparently I'm being told by some people that that has changed. Um, the white garment of the ikhram consists of two pieces of white cloth. The cloth covering the upper part of the body is called the ridha, and the part cloth covering the lower part of the body is called the izza. And um, it's quite a vulnerable place to be because um, for most men that I know anyway, they've never worn a wraparound skirt. So that was my first time wearing a skirt and I'm gonna, that's my story and I'm gonna stick to it. Um, so in terms of preparation for Hajj and purification after donning the white garment of Ikram and verbally declaring the intention to perform Umrah or a specific type of Hajj, recite the Talbiyya. Now, intention in Islam is very important. Everything is by intention. So you make an intention to perform your hajj, and as you'll learn on Thursday night, inshallah, there are four different kinds of hajj. And there's a lot of little details that make them different. I'm gonna try not to overload you, but I'm gonna to try to explain that you'll need to know which kind you're doing so that you make the right intention. Now that you're in a state of ikram, and that is a spiritual as well as a physical, it's a state as well as a condition. So I've got these, two beach towel-like garments that I'm gonna wear for the duration of my Hajj. Um, but it's also a state. I want to be in a state of purity. It's like going back to my birth. We're born and a diaper is put on us. We go to Hajj, we take a bath, a shower, and Ikram is put on us. Now that you're in a state of ihram, you are subject to a number of prohibitions. You must not wear sewn clothing, cut or pluck hair, clip nails, cover your head, wear perfume, engage in sexual intercourse, enter into a marriage contract, hunt or cut down trees in the sacred precinct or become angry. Now, I'm guessing that every single person in my class today has been to Disney or Universal or to some major theme park. And if we were live, I would pose the question to you, how many of you went there and didn't get angry? Now, typically when I ask this question in colleges and in various institutions where I'm teaching, somebody, one, maybe one will say no. They are the exception. Now imagine exponentially to that theme park going where there's three to six million in the future people, doing all the same thing and you can't get angry. Now Allah is merciful and hopefully Allah would forgive you, but according to authentic Hadith, if you, do, if you get angry, you lose the reward and you have to do that act over again. So here you see a picture of, the, uh, of a pilgrim in the state of Ikram, the top piece, uh, you can't see the bottom piece, but this is, what it looks like. Pilgrimage is due on well-known months. So whoever decides to make the pilgrimage, let him or her remember that there should be no obscenity or wickedness or angry argument on the pilgrimage. So in case you thought I wasn't gonna give you a proof for what I just said, here it is from Surah al -Bakr.
God has made it a place of security where everybody there is equal. That same seamless fabric that I was wearing is the same fabric that would be worn by King Abdullah if he were standing beside me in the Hajj. This is the spirit of what Islam teaches. Now, what really happens is that all of the, the sort of security staff there, when the royal family now comes, which is very different than how the Prophet Sallallahu did things, they come in these very expensive vehicles and literally everybody sort of parts way for them to come in and they just do their thing and they leave very protected. Not according to the Quran of the Sun. Uh, the native has no more right than the one who visits. And it is important. I think the message in this is that we have to transcend divisive things. And even in our work, in our family, in the Islamic family, the non-castigating, non-critical, non-indicting Islamic family, we must know that sometimes we must agree to disagree. It's very important. We don't let things like our opinions cause us to be, to, to divide. Now, I talked about the makats, the stations, the messenger specified, Salih Salam, those locations is said, they are the locations for whomever passes by them of those who are not their inhabitants and for whomever wants to make Hajj or Umrah. So the Messenger of Allah told us there are these five places, these stations, and you must go. So man didn't decide, well, we're just going to put one here. We're going to put one here. The Messenger knew that these five places were established for that. And I don't think you can see this picture well, but um, this is a picture that shows you the five Mekat. Now, um, these are the names of them. I've put all five of them here, and you can see the distance that each one of them um, are from, uh, actually from um, the Kibla, Kibla. And this is the pilgrim route. So you see Mecca to Mina to Misdalafa to Arafat. And so this sort of gives you an idea of the places you'll be learning about and hearing about. Now here are, I'm going to talk about three types of Hajj, just to sort of give you an idea. Hajj al-Tamattu involves performing Umrah and then Hajj. And there are many people that I know that have performed like 40 Umrahs. I've known many people that every year of their life they go to Umrah. But remember, that's not, not going to fulfill your fifth pillar. But there are many people that go for the blessings, for the forgiveness of that. Hajj al-Ifrad involves performing Hajj only. A sacrificial animal is not obligatory, and that is specific to those who live in Mecca. Hajj al-Quran involves combining Umrah and Hajj with only one Ihram for both. And then the Hajj al-Tamatu, uh, this form of Hajj is considered the best of three forms of Hajj, it is the one that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu urged his followers to perform, and it is the one adopted by most pilgrims uh, from overseas. So, and this is the, the type of Hajj, alhamdulillah, that I performed, and I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepted. So we're going to talk about the stages of Hajj, inshallah. Uh, hajj preparation at home, uh, now, some scholars will argue with me on this today, uh, but the best practice, I'm going to give you the best practice. You can always find an argument, and you can find an argument that will satisfy your nafs sometimes as well. Um, just remember that Allah will know what you did. Allah is watching. Hajj preparation at home is to pay all your debts, reconcile with people whom you have harmed, prepare your will, Secure funding for home and abroad to make sure your family's taken care of. Imagine I'm going to fulfill the fifth pillar of Islam, but I don't give my rights to my family. I don't leave money for my wife. And I've actually known of people that did this. Um, you must uh, secure your accommodations. Make sure your visas and passports are all uh, according to the latest policies. Uh, vaccinations are required in many places. Uh, lessons about rituals and transportation. 
Um, so it's highly recommended that you take a class before you go to Hodge so you know what you're going to do when you get there. A lot of people hop on a plane, they don't have a clue what they're doing. And so they sort of do a 50% job of their fifth pillar of their religion. So travel to Mecca and go directly to Al Masjid Al Haram uh, with Wudu and enter the Masjid on the right foot from the Asalam As gate, asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to open the doors of mercy. And this is day one. So perform the welcome tawaf, which is seven circumambulations of the Kaaba, and pray two rakat behind Maqam Ibrahim, the station of Ibrahim. Drink from the water of Zamzam, and then do Sa'i in Mecca. Now, the eighth of Dhul Hijjah, uh, the um, Ihram for the Hajj at Tabatu, if combining it with Umrah, then you can see that there's a few um, things different. That's why I'm pointing these out. After performing, Gusul and Wudu put on the Ihram and pray to Rakat morning prayers before noon. Uh, men will be saying, and you'll hear this beautiful chant, La Baik Allahumma La Baik, La Baik Allahumma La Baik, La Sharika La La Baik. It's, it's so profound, and it's a chant. I, I cried all the time. I just cried so much of the time. I, I couldn't even say the chant for crying. I would have to sort of keep regaining myself. But what you're saying is, I am responding to your call by making Hajj. You will then travel 3.1 miles from Mecca to Medina before noon, uh, and you'll stay two days. A uh, hundred thousand air-conditioned tents uh, were in the encampment when I was there, just to give you an idea. You will go to the Mina area. You'll pray five daily prayers in Mina. You'll shorten the four rakat prayers to two, but you won't combine them. That's a little different for Hajj. You'll stay in Mina until the sunrise of the night of Dhul Hijjah. And here is this, uh, I took, a, I had a picture here. This is, you can see the air conditioned stack and the tents. Um, I had the blessing of staying in those tents, alhamdulillah. On the ninth of Dhul Hijjah, you will travel eight miles from Mina to the plain of Arafat. Now, folks, uh, it's apparently very improved, but when I was there, we were moving about five miles an hour. Buses were literally, it would not be safe to put even your hand out of the window. The vehicles are so close. And yet, if they're not, you'll see people trying to squeeze between these vehicles, trying to jump on a bus, because many of them are walking. So it's you know, if you're not centered, if your state, your hal is not right, you can find yourself very stressed. So you travel eight miles from Mina to the plain of Arafat, the afternoon of the ninth of Dhul Hijjah to perform wafuk, which is reciting the astaghfirah and making supplications. So astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah. And you're asking Allah to forgive you and you are supplicating to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then you are reciting the talbiyah. And the sound in the in the bus, la baika la huma la baik, la baika la sharika la ka la baik. In alhamd one amat la ka wal muk, la sharika la. Here I am, O Allah. Here I am. Here I am. You have no partner. Here I am. Verily, all praise and blessings are yours, and all sovereignty. You have no partner. And so here is the mountain of mercy. Uh, Jabal is mountain uh, in Arabic and Rahman. Obviously, this is the mountain of mercy. Rahma comes from, uh, is the root of this word Rahman. So on the ninth of Dhul Hijjah, you will stay in Arafat. You'll listen to the khutbah at Masjid Namira. You will then shorten and combine Dur and Asr, because see you've traveled, technically speaking, to another city, although what you saw that it was a very short, I think eight miles if I remember correctly. You'll spend the whole day praising Allah, asking forgiveness and guidance and making dua for Muslims. After sunset, you will leave Muzdalafa, moving quietly 
for 5.2 miles while reciting the Tabiya. And here is the Masjid Namara, 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 I'm sorry that, and you can see all of the pilgrims around the Masjid. Um, it's something really that you cannot explain. I have never heard any scholar give a sufficient explanation of the experience of Hajj. And when I came back from Hajj, every time I opened my mouth to try to tell somebody, I started crying and that went on for three weeks. I had all of these speaking engagements I was supposed to give and I told the people I cannot do it. They were postponed and rescheduled, but I could not do it. Uh, it took me that long to sort of come back to earth. So on that ninth day, you stay the night, you combine your Maghrib and your Isha, you pray Fajr there, and you collect your pebbles for stoning. Now imagine in the, in the middle of three million people, you gotta remember that you're gonna collect some stones and you don't have a pocket in that ihram. Go to al-Mash'ar al-Haram, the valley between Muzdalafa and Mena, and make dua until the brightness of the sun is widespread. Leave Muzdalafa for Mena. Mention the name of Allah and recite Tawbiya until you stone the Jamarat al Akbar. And that's basically the big Aqaba is the big Jamarat. And here is the Al Masha al Haram. And then the 10th day is Eid for us here at home. After sunrise, reach Mena, go to Jamrat al Aqaba and throw seven pebbles, not larger than a bean, successively making tak beer with each one. Allahu Akbar. Now, please, I beg all of my students that if you listen, when you go to Hajj, remember it's a pebble, no larger than a chickpea. A pebble, no larger than a chickpea. A pebble, no larger than a chickpea. While I was there, I got hit on the back of the head with a rock larger than a golf ball, but not quite the size of a tennis ball. As I recovered, then I got hit with a shoe. People get zealous, they're not educated, they're ignorant, and then they treat their hodge like it's just any other thing you're doing. Educate yourself and remember the sanctity of that place and the sanctity of the people that are worshiping with you in that place. And that would not entail being able to throw a rock at somebody. So here you see uh, what the Jamarats look like when I was at Hodge on the left here. Uh, and then on the right, this is how it looked in 2014 with, I believe it's a, um, a covered, partly covered anyway, uh, walkway um, and then I think there's a train that goes around if I remember correctly something like that now. So on the 10th until the 13th which we know is the days of Tashrik after stoning slaughter or appointing someone to slaughter the sacrificial animal for you which is a non-defective sheep lamb or one-seventh of a cow or a camel with others you We've already been over this. You can eat up to one third of it, offer a third of it as a gift and a third to the poor. Predominantly in Saudi Arabia, the hajis, obviously they can't take the meat back with them. All of their meat, they sign a waiver, is donated to the poor. Um, it is canned in Saudi Arabia in many cases and sent to the indigent. Now that's a beautiful story, but later on as I'm making this presentation or, or on Thursday night, you're going to find some rather interesting extravagances that are not in keeping with Islam. So in Surah al-Baqarah, and shave not your heads until the gifts, the slaughtered animal, have reached their destination. So here again, you see these instructions are from the Quran. Uh, so on the 10th of dhul the males get their heads shaved or trimmed. Women trim a fingertips length from their hair. And all of this phase, all the prohibitions of the state of Ikram are no longer applicable. A pilgrim can resume normal life except for sexual intercourse. They make tawaf ifada, that's the farewell 
tawaf. They circumambulate the Kaaba seven times, starting at the black stone by kissing, touching, or pointing to it, and make takbir each time you come to it. Men increase their speed in the first three rounds of tawaf while making tawaf, reciting any dua or making dhikr. So you have, must remember all of this stuff in the midst of three million people. Between the Rook and Yemeni and the Black Stone, this particular dua is made. And it's so beautiful. O oh Lord, grant us goodness in this world and goodness in the hereafter and protect us from the torment of the fire. Beautiful had the uh, beautiful uh, dua. When you finish the seven circumambulations, you pray to Rakat behind Maqam Ibrahim, if possible. You drink from the water of Zamzam, and then you go to the Safa and Mara area. You raise your hands and face the Kaaba. Praise Allah. Make takbir three times and make dua. In Surah Al Baqarah, verse two, sorry, verse one fifty-eight, chapter two. Every time you are on Safa or Mara, surely Safa and Marwa are among the indications of Allah. So if those who make Hajj or make Umrah should go around them, there is no sin in doing this. And if everyone volunteers to do good for him or herself, verily Allah recognizes and knows. You then descend from Safa and walk between the two hills of Safa and Marwa at normal speed. Men should speed up their walk between the two green marks. And I'll show you a picture of this, inshallah. Mention the name of Allah, recite Quran, and make dua for yourself, your family, and for all Muslims while waking, walking. And I do see that there's some chat, and I will answer all the questions when I finish the lecture, inshallah. You ascend the hill of Marwah and make some, duplicate, some dua, uh, make the same du'a that you made at Safa. Now, I believe that you can no longer ascend the hill. Um, when I was there, you could climb to the top of the hill. I believe that now they have encased that with glass. You can see it and you can make your du'a, but you can't climb up it. And so you re repeat steps one and two until you finish seven rounds. You make du'a and praise Almighty Allah. This is a picture of the Sa'i area. You can see some pilgrims there and you can see the green lights that I was talking about. And if you look at the picture on the left, you can see these two green lines represent um, the walking, the fast walking area. Um, and you can see that in the middle, they have a place for handicapped folks. So they are wheelchair accessible. After finishing your tawaf in Sa'i, leave Mecca and go to Mina to spend the night. You pray day and night prayers, shorten the four rakats to rakats, but you do not combine them. On the 11th of Dhul Hijr, after Duhur prayer, go to the Jamarat area in Mina. Start with Al Jamra As Subra, the smallest, throw seven pebbles successively while making takbir with each pebble, not exceeding the size of a bean, a chickpea, and make dua. Number two, you go to the next Jamarat or Wusta, the medium. You throw seven pebbles with the same rules. And then you go to Jamara or Kubra, and you saw in the picture three of them. That's the largest one. Uh, and you throw seven pebbles. After finishing your Tawaf and Sa'i, leave Mecca for Mena and go spend the night in Mena at least from midnight to Fajr. Then you stay in Mena to pray the day and night prayers, shorten the four rakats, the two rakats, do not combine. Now, what you'll notice is this is all in three days. <laughs> Go to the Jamarat area on the 12th uh, in Mena. Start with the Al-Jamarat Al-Sukhra, the smallest. Then you go to Al-Wusta, the medium. And then, of course, you go to the largest one. After finishing your Tawaf and Sa'i, you leave Mecca for Mina. Mina and you go spend the night at Mena from at least midnight to Fajr. You stay in Mena, and again, you from the prayers, but you don't combine them. So then on the 13th day, you go to the Jamarat area. You do the same thing again, and then you make your farewell tawaf. 
Um, and that's no specific date on that because some people will stay for some period of time. Um, but you circumambulate the Kaaba seven times, the black stone by kissing, touching, or pointing to it and making takbir each time. While making the towel, if you recite any dua, make dhikr, ending each round at the black stone. Between the Rukh and Yemeni and the black stone, you make the dua, O oh Allah, grant us goodness in this world and goodness in the hereafter and protect us from the torment of the fire. When you finish the seven rounds, pray two rakats behind the Makam Ibrahim. If possible, drink from the water of Zamzam. Uh, go back home before your visa expires. That's a real good idea. Thank Allah for helping you perform Hajj and ask Allah to accept your rituals. So um, we'll pick back up here, inshallah, on Thursday night, um, and I will show you various parts of the Kaaba, um, explain them to you, talk about the size, talk about uh, a lot of the sort of accoutrement around that uh, Kaaba. So let me have a look here at the questions that were posed, and why am I... Here we are, let's see, chat. Okay. Um, typically the head of the house um, will take care of the sacrifice, uh, but remember, as I said on Thursday night, it's an equal opportunity religion. Women are allowed to do their own slaughter. Women can actually do a slaughter. This is, and I gave the authentic proofs for that on Thursday night. Um, so mostly the families take care of your zakat. That's another sort of lesson and, and I'll come back and visit that. Uh, I'll, I'll answer that question again. I always like to have the fic in front of me because I just don't have the kind of brain that maintains all of the intrinsic um, exceptions. I don't believe there are any more in the chats. Just want to make sure questions. Perfect. Okay. So um, does anyone have any comments or questions? Let's see. I'm going to ask my co-host, do they need to be unmuted or anything? All right. I'm guessing that I'm not getting any questions or comments. Is that correct? The only question I had from Sykes was the shoe the size of a chickpea that hit you, or was it bigger? I know. I think it was about a size 13 or something like that. Um, Ouch. Yeah. Um, I, I literally had seen stars from the rock, and just as I was recovering, I got hit by that shoe. So I don't know, maybe they should start wearing helmets. <laughs> but the Prophet Sallam didn't wear one, so that would be an, quite an innovation. But I, I will tell you that it was very scary for me when I was hit by that rock. Yes, I'm sure it was. I When you said that, I think I heard you say that, or we've heard you say that before. That's really unfortunate and I have a lot of empathy for you trying to do the just in that the energy and the and you know doing everything you're doing there and then to get 